Good morning, everybody. It's half past nine, and I'm very glad to welcome you to the session of the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. I'm pleased to see so many familiar faces, but also new faces interested in the topic of our session today. For a start, I would like to quickly introduce you to the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety, and that is somehow a short trip to the past. It was in the year 2007, that's the second IGF in Rio de Janeiro, that child welfare activists decided to join forces in order to keep children safe online. And that marked the birth of the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. The coalition has grown over the years with stakeholders from child welfare, be it from governmental organizations, civil society, or private industry. And we are working throughout the year to assess current technological developments, new devices, services, and applications in regard of their impact on children's lives. And also to ensure that measures are taken to keep children safe online. Mm -hmm. Dynamic collisions are a certain type of um, form or format uh, in the IGF ecosystem. They are open to any individual as well as to any organization, and I would like to take the opportunity to join the Dynamic Coalition. Just come to us, talk to us, send an email, and feel free to work with the Dynamic Coalition. Um, the Dynamic Coalition is led by ECPAT International, and my honored colleague, Marie-Laure Lemineur, sitting here in front, and just see her face and uh, contact her uh, whenever you like uh, when you're interested to becoming a member of the Dynamic Coalition. Those of you who are working with and for children may know that it was only last week that we celebrated the 30th anniversary of the UN Convention of the Rights of the Child, shortly the UNCRC. That is the most ratified human rights treaty in the world with 196 states having themselves committed to respect, protect, and fulfill the rights of the child. And with ratification of the UN Convention, they are legally bound to do so. In 1989, neither those who have originally phrased the UN Convention nor those who have ratified it could have imagined to what extent children would inhabit the digital world 30 years later. Nonetheless, that is what we are talking about today in the next 90 minutes. The UN Convention provides for children rights in all areas of life. Many of the rights dedicated to children need to be looked from, at from a new uh, angle with regard to the digital environment. These are the rights like access to information or freedom of expression where it's obvious that it's related to using digital media, but it's also a right like that that is laid down in Article 31, which is our focus today. This is the right to leisure, play, and culture. And I would like to quote that article. Uh, it reads as follows. States parties recognize the right of the child to rest and leisure, to engage in play and recreational activities appropriate to the, the age of the child, and to participate freely in cultural life 
and the arts. The online environment is now a key arena within which that right is exercised, and our distinguished panelists will shed light on this arena today. I would like to introduce them to you now, and I will start with Sean Prendergast, who is a young internet user playing games, and he will tell us about his experiences. We have Daniel Karfeld winter from UNICEF, uh, who has prepared a report uh, on children's rights and online gaming, and he will uh, present some of the findings from the report. Uh, on the very left, from my side, we have John Carr, today speaking for ACPAT International, also he has many hats on his head and can uh, tell us several stories. Then, to my right, I have Emily Kastein, Cashman Kirstein, sorry <laughs> if I pronounced it wrong, yeah. coming from a child's protection organization which is called Phone. You will introduce us to that. Then we have Clement Leong, uh, also known as Stinky, and he is an esports moderator organizing also tournaments on esports. Welcome on our panel. We have on the very right, Lise van Russel, who is a researcher at the Martin Luther University in Halle, uh, researching the development of free-to-play games. And last but not least, we have Vicky Schockbold, representing the voice of the parents. I'm Jutta Kroll from the German Digital Opportunities Foundation, there leading a project on children's rights in the digital environment one of the founding members of the Dynamic Coalition, which I'm very glad of to do so. And now we will start the panel. And first, you have the floor, Daniel. Thank you very much, Jutta, both for the introduction and for inviting me to speak. Uh, I'm really excited to be here to talk to you all about online gaming. It's a, it's a fascinating space. Uh, the gaming industry is growing, not only in terms of profit or the number of players it engages, but also in terms of geographical reach, uh, technological capacity. Um, and this, this means that as an industry, they need to start assuming greater responsibility for the environments that they are um, developing. For this reason, UNICEF developed um, a paper on online gaming and child rights as a first attempt to, to explore the implications of the online gaming environment and the business sector for children's rights. And just at the outset to say that UNICEF's approach to child rights is fundamentally holistic. And what I mean by that is that we try to take into account all rights of children in our work. Because the rights are interdependent, and they can't be separated. Nor can we choose to account only for some rights and ignore others. So for example, if we're talking about age verification or blocking or filtering of content as a way to uphold children's right to protection from harm in the gaming environment, then those measures need to be balanced with children's rights to provision of information, right to participation, leisure, play, etc. And so this paper that we've developed, it's, it's meant as a conversation starter, both for us internally, uh, to inform our own engagement with the industry, but also externally, um, for, for other people who are now starting to think about the implications of this sector for uh, children's rights. And we're also interested, of course, in working with the industry so that they can become more child rights compliant in their work. And so the paper points to a number of areas, really, where we think that the industry has either um, opportunities to support the realization of children's rights, or areas where more work really needs to be done to ensure that some of the other rights are protected. And so far, I mean, the paper was released about a month ago, and it's been fairly well received. Uh, the industry, we presented it at the Fair Play Alliance Summit in London to the industry, more than 90 companies. And I think they felt that we had actually done justice to many of the topics that we bring up. Um, and I'm not going to go into too much detail of the paper because I don't have time to do that. But just to briefly say that some of the issues we consider are things like how the gaming industry need to deal with toxic environments, racism, sexism in games, for example, or gender stereotyping. We look at monetization practices, especially around free-to-play games. We might hear more about that um, from the speaker on my right. Um, and we look briefly also at issues um, around violence in video games, which is a contentious topic, um, and just try to put a number of questions on the table. We don't try to offer direct solutions. 
Now, what I wanted to do is to draw your attention to three points that have really come out of working with this paper that I think we need to address in order to be able to engage constructively with the industry. The first one is that the evidence base, so the research on, around children and online gaming is quite weak, uh, with a few notable exceptions perhaps in the last year. So we have a lot of small-scale research, often using somewhat dubious measurements, um, and kind of drawing conclusions or making extrapolations that the data doesn't really support. Um, and most research on gaming really has been quite adult-driven, uh, reflecting, I think, more of our perceptions of gaming rather than children's realities. And this, I think, is a problem. And I think personally that this has made it considerably more difficult to draw sound conclusions about the overall benefits and harm um, of gaming for children. And that really needs to be improved going forward because I don't think that we've asked the right questions so far. Which leads me to the second point, which is that there are many unanswered questions with respect to industry operations that we need to deal with. So compared to social media companies, for example, I think we know even less about what kind of data is being collected from children in games and how it's used. We keep hearing about algorithms that use children's data to push certain content to keep them playing, or monetization schemes that exploit psychological vulnerabilities to drive purchases. But are these things actually true? And if so, how common are they? My guess would be that some companies might use frustration mechanics to drive sales, but that most companies probably do not, uh, because it's a short-term business strategy. But again, we need to know more. And we need to stop lumping gaming companies together under a common label, like the gaming industry. Because actually, companies are very different in how they operate. Their monetization schemas look different. The gaming environments they provide look different. And so we really need to keep that in mind for our recommendations to be realistic and for companies to actually be able to engage with them. And my third and final point, and this is something that frustrates me a little bit. I mean, we have an environment here where children willingly spend a lot of time happily doing fairly mundane and repetitive tasks sometimes and they find it really enjoyable. And it's an environment that we have the opportunity to shape, yet we keep focusing on the negatives, on protecting children from harm rather than figuring out how to harness the positives. And of course, safety is paramount, but really a child rights perspective demands more than that. So just think about it. I mean, what kind of informal learning opportunities do we see coming out from gaming? There are a few people who have done research on this, but a lot more could be done, and I think the opportunities here are considerable. How can we use children's fascination with the gaming environment to model positive behavior? And who could do that? Streamers, esports stars, other players? And can we use the gaming environment to share messages about healthy eating, physical exercise, or to provide positive mental health support? I mean, a lot of games are being developed now that try to depict mental ill health like psychosis or anxiety to raise awareness around these issues. So how can we use that? And I think these are some of the questions that I think we need to understand better to really make the gaming environment work for children in their best interests. Thank you very much. Thank you, Daniel, for this short overview. I do think it uh, touched upon several issues that will be addressed by the panels in the uh, during the discussion. And now I may uh, turn to Sean. And would you like to tell us when you did start gaming and also what fascinated you at the beginning when you started gaming? Uh, I started gaming, I think, around 2010. Um, I started playing Minecraft first. Um, that was my first big actual game that I played. And I started off by myself with my sister. And that's how I just played, and it was a big moment for me because, like, allowing me to do what I wanted in a game where I could just have any freedom was something that I really enjoyed. And then I eventually got into multiplayer, and that's where things started to uh, take uh, off and uh, eventually started downloading other games. Okay. Uh, thank you. I, I know your sister is also in the room, so... You, you did not play only on your own, you, you did play together. Can you explain that a bit, what you did with Minecraft? Um, I think since me and my sister both liked Minecraft, we only had one uh, computer, so we would often switch computers and play Minecraft and build structures and 
just come up with ideas and build them, and uh, that's what um, early gaming was like back in 2011 and 2010 for someone who was seven and eight years old. And uh, at that point of time, did you feel in any kind at risk of being harmed when playing that game? Not in single player when I was playing with my sister, but as I moved to multiplayer, playing with other online players that could communicate with me, I did feel that my actions could have big consequences and um, it could lead to things that can get out of hand. So, so the uh, feeling of there might be a risk of being harmed was more related to the communication you had during that game, the contact you had to other gamers? Yes, I do feel that talking with other players is a big role in why gaming is big today. And um, back then, it wasn't looked on that much, but um, that was something that I didn't really understand back when I was seven. I do think we will come back to that point later on the discussion. I was just asking about the risks because the two speakers we have now on the panel are also working with uh, trying to avoid risks uh, for children, improving their safety. And I first give the floor to John Carr, speaking for ACPAD International. All right, okay, it's working now. Yep, okay, so John Carr, um, representing, I live in London, um, UK, but I'm representing uh, ECPAT International, which is a global NGO uh, based in uh, Bangkok. I first got interested in, in this issue when my own children started using games, but my, <coughs> my interest uh, was peaked from a child protection point of view uh, when there was a report, um, this is several years after my children had sort of grown up and gone to university and so on, um, by the report in the United Kingdom of a, a terrible case where a young boy had gone into a gaming environment at which, like many of the online gaming environments which exist now, had a chat function, a chat facility, an interactive component to it, got talking to this person um, befriended them, and it then followed a fairly typical uh, pathway for these types of uh, things, which turned out to be what we now call grooming. Anyway, long story, long story short, uh, this young man, after playing many, many different games online with this person, uh, agreed to go to his house, uh, and he did, and he was raped and murdered. Uh, by the man who he had befriended initially through this gaming environment. Um, another, another instance uh, that caught my eye, and again, as I say, piqued my, piqued my interest, uh, was of a report from, I think it was, it was South Korea or China, I can't, I, I'm not, it might have been both. Anyway, the, the point there was some young people were becoming so hooked and so apparently addicted to online gaming. There was this one particular case that sticks in my mind where the young, this particular young man had rigged his games console in the toilet, right? So he could sit on the toilet whilst playing his games without having to break off to attend even to the call of nature. Now that did suggest again that there was something in particular about these sorts of environments that was new. Uh, and in fact, the reason this was discovered was the young man died. Um, he, he never, uh, he had some kind of heart attack or seizure in the middle of the game and uh, eventually he was found dead on his console, with his console by his side uh, in the toilet. So these were, these were two very, very unusual and striking things. And in no sense are they typical, obviously, uh, but they do point to risks that haven't existed previously and are very severe and dramatic and which we all ought to know about, both as parents, as child care professionals, but above all, perhaps, as, the, as we want the gaming industry to be aware of them and, and take whatever steps they can to minimize the risk of repetition. But just by the way, I, I, um, 
Google this just now uh, to confirm that my memory was correct. The average age of a gamer is 35, okay? It's not a child. But the, the way in which games are aggressively marketed to young people inevitably has drawn substantial numbers of young people into uh, a gaming, uh, into the game. And they are, they are a, a very, very contemporary and modern form of play. And if you're in a school playground or if you're at school, if you're not into the latest games, you're going to be the nerdy kid who doesn't really fit in with, with the social set. So it's a fact. It is a fact of modern children's lives. And it's one of the reasons why we, as I say, as childcare professionals, parents, and now in my case, grandparents, need to take a, a, a much greater interest in it. And one of the features of the gaming industry, which I'm afraid is exceptionally common, it's the norm, in fact, uh, of the high-tech industries as a whole, is a complete lack of transparency about what it is they're actually doing to safeguard children, both in relation to potential for addiction, both in relation to grooming uh, behavior of the kind that I mentioned at the beginning, um, and also, thirdly, in respect of the commercial dimension. So these are very big and extremely profitable businesses. And I'm not going to steal my friend Vicky's uh, thunder here, because I'm scared of her, by the way. Um, <coughs> But she will speak in particular about the ways in which families uh, are being, as it were, dragged into debt or uh, uh, spending far more money than they thought they were going to be doing precisely because their children have been drawn into uh, a gaming environment. Another quick dimension is the, to, to refer to here is the privacy uh, aspect of it. This goes back to the point about transparency. Uh, in the UK, again, uh, we've developed or we are developing a privacy code which specifically addresses uh, the question, actually it addresses connected toys and games and makes it clear to the manufacturers or providers of both that they must make explicit the kind of data that they are collecting in, in, the, in the gaming environment that they're drawing children into, how they process that data, where that data ends up, and so on. And one of the reasons that this has become prominent, uh, and it, it's, not, it, it's not because of something that happened in Britain, I think it was in America and, and Germany, I think, uh, was that a lot of the data that children were uh, creating, or in the case of toys, uh, generating through speaking to the device, was being recorded on servers uh, in distant lands, and these servers were being hacked because the security of the servers was not up to standard. So we don't know of any cases that have led to any child being directly harmed as a result of that data being hacked, but the very fact that it was happening came as a complete shock, a complete surprise to parents who had no idea that when they were buying these games or when they were buying these toys for their children, that that was one of the things that could happen as a result. So there are lots and lots of things. I mean, nobody, obviously nobody wants to stop children playing. There, can be, there are lots of very positive aspects of the gaming environment, problem solving, learning to work with teams and all of those kinds of things that are very much beneficial for children in, in the 21st century. That's not our, our gripe. Our gripe, or my gripe at any rate, is the lack of attention that's being paid to these new and immersive environments from the point of view of children's health and welfare. So it's not one or the other. We need a little bit of both. Thank you, John. Uh, that was a very good description of the landscape that is uh, more or less also um, yeah, shows us where the risks may lie in, in a very broad sense. So may I turn to you, Emily, uh, and you, I, I would like to invite you to uh, explain a little bit what, what Thorne is doing in the United States and then turn to the games issue. Absolutely. I think that's really great. Thank you so much. Um, so just to give, as you did mention, some background on Thorne, um, we're a nonprofit in the United States and we function very much like a tech startup. Our mission is to build technology to defend children from sexual abuse and exploitation. And so we're kind of pushing the boundaries of what it means to be a nonprofit in that we actually build software, both for law enforcement to help identify victims of child abuse and exploitation faster, and also for industry to help remove um, child sexual abuse material CSAM or what may be legal 
legally defined as child pornography from their platform. So today, in terms of gaming um, and the nexus between our work and gaming, um, comes from both um, the software side of the house and also from our research and prevention side. So starting on the research and prevention side, um, you know, at Thorne, we believe that kids need to be supported so that they can successfully navigate this balance between exploration and safety, which I think we're going to be focusing a lot on today. Um, and you know, like some of uh, the folks in our, our panel, we found that there wasn't a lot of recent data um, about this issue. And so we took it upon ourselves to do some, some research ourselves. Um, one of the pieces that we research that is relevant to today's conversation relates to sextortion, um, which to define it is the threat to reveal intimate images um, to coerce action. And um, between 2015 and 2017, we surveyed about 3,500 young people um, in the United States. Um, and just some key pieces I wanted to flag today. Um, at the beginning of online friendships, um, it was reported to us that a lot of um, uh, participants share the handles on multiple different accounts, not just the accounts that they meet on. Um, and in sextortion scenarios, should it get to a point like that and makes it even harder for um, an offender, or easier for an offender to um, you know, target a, a young person on multiple platforms, not just the one they met on. And in fact, 45 participants in our survey who were um, in a sextortion scenario reported being contacted by the offender across multiple platforms. And in 2015, and specific to gaming, 4% um, of those who had experienced sextortion reported the involvement of a gaming platform. By 2017, that had doubled. Um, and that's something to 8%. And that's something that we are going to um, continue tracking into our research in 2020. Um, and just to give some sense of age here, uh, we heard that one in four victims were under 12 when they were first threatened, and 47% uh, who met their abuser online versus knew, knowing them in real life received threats daily in these scenarios. Um, so this kind of leads into some of the qualitative research we did more recently this year in 2019 um, that said, um, you know, apart from any abuse scenarios, just talking about which platforms were most um, popular with um, younger kids. And we found that the gaming platforms were generally more popular among 9 to 12 year olds. Um, and that was true with a number um, of platforms. We also found that in terms of how they were dealing with unwanted um, conversations and that sort of thing, we found that children were putting their own safeguards in place uh, to talk about, you know, to, um, to stop these um, incidents from happening. That f took the form of um, blocking is something that was widely used, simply ignoring the threats. And there was also um, some anecdotal feedback that if you reported a user, um, that didn't necessarily mean that that user would be able to stop talking to you or something like that. Um, so we're going to continue that research going into 2020, um, looking at prevention and education and awareness tools um, based on some of the, the research we're doing. And if I could just speak very briefly about what we're doing on platforms when I talked about kind of the software side of what we do. Um, we also have a tool that we had just launched within the past year called Safer. And what this does is it utilizes hashing technology to identify known content, bad content, CSAM, child sexual abuse material, on internet platforms um, enabled to be able to have um, those platforms identify, remove, and report that content. So in terms of gaming, this could come into play for a gaming platform that may have uh, kind of um, direct messages or group chats that enables file sharing. Um, if any of these um, you know, files that are known to be illegal content and child sexual abuse material, that they would be immediately flagged for the platform, removed, and then reported to authorities. So um, that's kind of just a, a wrap up of, of what we do at Thorn. Let me give one uh, first question. Would you say when you uh, talk about working with the platforms and what they could use or utilize to keep children safer, would you call that safety by design? I think that's part of it. I think, um, you know, going more into the conversation that I'm sure we'll have today, I think when we're talking about new platforms that may not be thinking about how 
um, their platform could be misused um, in you know minority cases. I think that's a big piece is getting, um, I think it was the Australian e-commissioner putting that forward um, and building in these safeguards and understanding how their platforms may be misused from the beginning to build in those safety measures at the onset. Okay, thank you. So to balance the panel a bit, I would now like to talk also about the opportunities, although Danielle has mentioned that the report was focused very much on the opportunities. Uh, so let me turn to uh, Clément, and would you like to explain a little bit more what you're doing when you organize tournaments, who are the gamers who take part in these tournaments, and how do you moderate esports? Uh, so, I'm Clement Lang. I normally go by Stinky. Uh, I'm affiliated with the Dot .Asia organization, uh, but I'm also an esports caster and I uh, organize tournaments and I do some back-end administration stuff. I wouldn't necessarily say I'm an expert on, on uh, gaming particularly, but p perhaps I can offer a bit of a different perspective. Uh, so first of all, there, there is a bit of a distinction between games and esports, and I'd like to talk about both uh, separately. I don't think the definition is something that's particularly relevant, but uh, let me begin by saying that I think games and play is very important. You know, in the wild for animals, it's an important part of how they learn. Um, we know that in early child development, you know, the social learning is very important, and I think games are a very good medium for that. And that you know, is not just limited to video games. I think that applies to a lot of board games. Uh, sort of physical, uh, tactile games as well. I think that's very uh, important. And there's a lot of you know potential for games. You know when you're talking about sort of the storytelling potential that some of these games have. When you're talking about the procedural logic that sort of puzzles the strategies that you can apply. And this is more specific to the esports side. But once you start introducing, uh, I guess, competition, when you start introducing structure, there's a lot more potential there as well. Uh, but obviously we're, we're here to talk about sort of the threats that video games can bring in addition to some of the opportunities. Uh, again, I'm not an expert in this field, but I, I guess I'd like to highlight some trends that we've sort of seen over the years, over the decades that have happened. Uh, so first of all, the, the hardware that these games operate on, when they first were, I guess, designed, when you're talking about you know, games like Pong, they were often on dedicated machines that only ran that one game. And we saw something similar you know, when you get to these arcade games, I guess when they kind of exploded in maybe the 90s or, or, the, or the 80s, where you get these you know, large machines, come with the controls, come with the screen, come with the game and often you know, focused in places that you know, would, would do other games such as you know, maybe pinball. And then you, you get to the evolution of games where you have multiple games that will run on a single console platform. So that would be, you know, in modern terms, stuff like the PS4, the Xbox One. And you also have a, a significant portion, which are, you know, I, I guess, a pretty big market now, which is maybe started in the 90s, which is PC gaming. And uh, there's been a huge shift from that in the past decade or so where you get to smaller screens, when you get to mobile games. And that's sort of the latest evolution of the hardware that we see. And sort of going with this, you see a change in the participation model. So when you're you know, on, playing at an arcade, it's a very social environment. There's other kids watching you. They're waiting for their turn. They're waiting for you to, to die or fail often so that they can have their go on the machine. And with consoles uh, starting in the maybe 2000s, you saw a lot of uh, social gaming where you go to someone's house, their console is plugged into the TV and you maybe share a screen together. But uh, you know, again, moving on to the evolution, when you're playing PC games, it tends to be alone. And uh, similar with mobile games, it's very hard to share a mobile screen. So the participation model has sort of shrunk and it's become less social and more individual, harder to share. And Obviously, that applies to, to fellow gamers, but I, I think that also has pretty big implications for the parents. Whereas before, you were very directly involved in what your children were playing. Now it's a lot harder when they're looking at their, at their mobile screens. 
Um, another trend which I think there, there are better qualified people to talk about is the business model that has sort of evolved. It used to be you know, very tied to the hardware when you buy a machine that comes with the games, but you know, with a PC, for example, you, you tend to have a general purpose PC and that can run games. You buy the games from the title. And now with, uh, I guess, a fairly recent trend, relatively speaking, is when you get these microtransactions, and I think that's going to be talked about a, a lot more later, and linked to these microtransactions is sometimes these loot boxes or, or potential gambling mechanics, as some people would have it. And uh, I know there's a lot of criticism about the potential harm that games can bring. So I guess in a way sort of to play the devil's advocate, but also as an avid gamer in support of games, I feel like there's a lot of potential for games, but there's a, a lot of potential for misuse or abuse of games. But at the same time, I feel like there's sort of symptoms or symptom relief even of bigger problems. So not necessarily a problem in itself. So you know you see people turn to games in a negative sense for a, a lot of issues that are, are possibly outside. So escapism from real life issues. You you go into your fantasy world, you know, to avoid your real life issues. Perhaps you're lonely. You know, perhaps you want to find other people to play with. You want to have some sort of collaborative experience. And uh, I know there's a lot of talk about addiction. And that's a very valid issue, especially when you're talking about the modern design of games. A lot of them are, are sort of built with, with the sort of Skinner box, the operant conditioning type addiction. You get that quick dopamine hit when you know something pops up on your screen. Um, and often that's also linked to the microtransactions as well. Uh, but personally, I feel a, a lot of the, the solution actually comes in greater participation in games when parents actually start being a lot more involved in the games that their children play. It's not, you know, here, here's a phone, go, go play on your phone. It's, it, it, I feel like it should be more of a, a shared experience, which you will often see with, with say, physical games, board games. Uh, I mean, Scrabble, Monopoly, I'm sure there's better examples out there. But it can be a very fun experience for a whole family, and we generally see the opposite instead, where as time goes on, it becomes more focused, more individual. And it's I, with that, I think, brings in a lot of the potential threats as well. Thanks a lot. I do think you have mentioned some issues that had not been mentioned before. And I, uh, I, I really do think you described very well this, this evolution of, of the gaming from the big machines to now having the small screen. And that would also mean for children especially to being in the different situation when playing games. Um, I, I would just have a sh quick question to you, Sean. Uh, we've heard a lot about the opportunities to learn when gaming. Could you say in one sentence what is the most important thing you learned when you were gaming? I think the most important thing I've learned by gaming is to control what I'm going to say and my con or, uh, actions. It's hard to say what you want to say because there can be people watching what you want to say and they're going to be looking for you and they're going to be looking at your age and what you want to do. So I think controlling what you want to say is a big part in gaming. Okay, so you have more developed your social uh, competence and social skills uh, when gaming. Uh, um, not only focused on the like uh, the using skills and, and your your technical experience. Yes. Okay. Thank you. So then I turn to Lies van Russell, who will present the the academia perspective uh, on games development and the business models behind that. Yeah. Uh, thanks a lot, Jutta, for inviting me, and letting me join in this panel. I'm very pleased to be here on my first uh, IGF. Uh, so I'm a games researcher and yeah, I do, uh, currently I'm based at the University of Halle uh, and my PhD research is about the German games industry, uh, especially the way the free-to-play monetization model intertwines with uh, development practices. Uh, so I'm really glad that uh, Daniel and also J John um, I drew attention to the fact there's actually generally a lack of research into this industry. 
Um, it has often been said that it's a black box and it's very secretive. Um, people working there tend to keep yeah, what they do to themselves. And with my research, I hope I can maybe uh, contribute a little bit to opening that black box and actually looking at what is happening in the industry. So I conducted interviews with German game developers asking them about the monetization model and how they kind of build it into uh, the game design and how it has to be kind of thought into the loop from the very beginning. Um, and also ask them like, for instance, how do you handle this tension when it's like controversial or what is to you still like ethically okay um, in terms of, of monetization because uh, this can be pretty aggressive. And I also agree very much with Daniel that we shouldn't lump the whole games industry together. There are uh, studios that make like very, uh, uh, that make premium games for instance that are really offer good experiences and there's others that might really try to um, exploit their players or really go for a, for a quick profit um, yeah, at the cost of maybe people getting addicted. Um, yeah, so there were two things I would like to uh, address in, in my input. Maybe we could uh, pick up on them in the discussion. Some things has been, um, has been touched upon already as well. Um, yeah, the first point is actually has been said a few times, but I think coming from a games research uh, background, um, I think it's generally good to always keep an eye on both sides, like uh, not only at the threats, although of course the, the work that, are people, that people are doing here is very important and relevant if there's really kids being abused or exploited, of course those topics should be, should be um, worked on. Um, but I think, uh, yeah, at the same time we still should also look at the opportunities that games offer. Um, of course, there is this whole field of serious games, which are games that try to teach something or to train or to, exercise, to, to have people exercise while playing. Um, but also next to the serious games, um, there are a lot of games that were made for like mere uh, entertainment purposes that still offer very valuable experiences. And of course, um, yeah, I'm very glad that Sean also mentioned uh, Minecraft, which is often also uh, given as a positive example of a game that can foster creativity, uh, can also uh, enhance uh, social skills. Um, yeah, so there's a lot of opportunities there, and um, I think we should not uh, um, lose sight of that side as well, even though there might be uh, harmful practices as well. Um, yeah, that was basically the, the first um, yeah, point I wanted to bring in. And the second is a little bit more specific and focuses more on uh, the research I work on myself. So if we look at these uh, rating systems, of course, they're available everywhere. Uh, you can see from what age uh, a game or an app is actually um, uh, suitable. There are, for instance, in Germany, there's the German Games Association game that uh, manages this uh, self-regulation program of uh, USK. Um, in which they give games age ratings based on content. Um, and my point here is that the age rating is very often um, based on, on the mere content of the game or like the graphical theme. So is there violence going on there or, um, or explicit um, sexual content? And yeah, in my opinion, we should uh, really try there also to keep in mind uh, the business model behind the game. So a game might have a very innocent theme like and, and very simple rules like um, matching candy or collecting cute animals or whatever where you might say okay this is suitable for all ages but then there's often behind the surface these uh, these monetization um, yeah um, strategies going on which I think are are more uh, of a threat than actual um, yeah maybe things that um, that look maybe a little bit more <laughs> gross or whatever um, yeah, so um, in these rating systems, I would plead that the, the people rating those games would, would take a more holistic approach and also look at, at the way the game is monetized and whether there's advertisement. Um, and I think there's also a, a part for the parents there to play to, to maybe not tend to the free games because of course the free games need to, be, need to make money in some way. So um, uh, maybe it is also worth spending three or four euros or dollars to uh, a game that was made in such a way that there doesn't need to be made a profit after downloading the game. Um, so um, yeah, again, we shouldn't lump it all together. Um, 
there are a lot of free-to-play games that have like more moderate monetization strategies as well, and there's a lot of ways uh, a free-to-play free -to game can be, can be monetized in the end. It can be additional content or additional moves, or even only like um, appearance, so maybe clothing for your avatar. Um, so I think there we should also distinguish between different monetization strategies and should uh, consider that in rating games for children as well. Um, yeah, I think in general um, what could help parents is like uh, platforms or collections where games are rated, so both in terms of their content and in terms of their um, uh, financial models or business models. For instance, the German Youth Institute, uh, DJE, has a database where apps for kids are reviewed and with regard to actually all these parameters, so the fun the game offers, the pedagogical content, but also the business models. Um, and I think those uh, places can offer a good start for parents and also for kids because, of course, everyone knows there's millions of apps these days in the app stores and it's really hard to find the good ones uh, and the ones that offer actual, actual um, added value instead of trying to exploit. So, yeah, that was my two cents and I'm looking forward to an interesting discussion. Thank you, Lise. I'm pretty sure we will have afterwards uh, questions also uh, in this regard. Um, you, you quoted the German Youth Institute with their database uh, where apps for children are rated. And in advance of producing the database, they also did some research how parents do their decision when deciding which uh, app would be appropriate for their children. And even for younger children, most parents who are not well experienced would say, okay, if, it, if I can get something for free, and another game that is in the App Store, it looks very similar, but I have to pay for it, why should I do so? So parents tend to choose also the free-to-play games without knowing the monetization model that is behind that. And I'm now turning to Vicky because I know you're working for Parents Zone, you have experience with parents, and uh, what is what is what you found out how parents do decide on their children gaming? Uh, thank you and thank you for inviting me to be here. It's always nice for parents to be included in these conversations. I, uh, I think what's fascinating about the, the gaming discussion that happens in families is that there is a very big gap between the uh, experience that young people are having and the worries and concerns that parents are expressing. So when we talk to parents, they will typically talk about the amount of time that their child is spending online. It's usually, what on earth can a child possibly be doing for so many hours? And it's the addiction debate that really is front of mind. Uh, perhaps they'll also be concerned about um, bad language in games, and maybe some of them have heard some of the very extreme cases that, that John talked about. When we talk to young people, um, they have a very different set of concerns and the concerns that young people talk about is the way the gaming um, space is changing and those monetization techniques are really evolving to the point where in the research that we did very recently half of the young people that we talked to said that they only thought gaming was fun when they were spending money in the game and that evolution of the gaming world has happened because games have have they're now streamed, so you no longer go and buy a game and that's it. You, you stream the game and those monetization techniques can continue all the time that you are in your gaming environment. And I think the, the enormous gulf between parent and adult's understanding of the gaming world and the reality of the gaming world is so vast that we have a very, very big job to do. Our research has all been led by young gamers because we found that the gaming environment was so complex that unless you had a very experienced gamer guiding you through it, it was really kind of impossible to understand what was, what was going on. And I, I just finish with one um, example of, how we, of the work that we did in the UK, which was around gambling and gaming and that connection between loot boxes and gambling and also skin gambling, which happens on parasite websites that live alongside um, platforms that allow you to exchange skins that you buy in a game. 
we approached schools in the UK and said, we would really like to talk to young people in your school about whether or not they know anything about skin gambling and the opportunities to gamble in gaming. And every single school said the same thing to us. Every single school said, you are very, very welcome to come and talk to our pupils, but none of our pupils gamble. And when we went to the schools and talked to the young people, not only did they all know about skin gambling, at least half of the pupils that we were talking to were actually skin gambling. And that's just one example of this huge gap between adults' understanding and gamers' understanding of what they're doing. So to answer your question, how do parents make decisions? Not terribly well and not in a very informed way. Thank you, Vicky. Um, Sean, I know that your parents are in the room, so I try to phrase the, the question very fair. Do you think your, your teachers do understand about the students' gaming and not talking about gambling, but gaming? Um, I feel like my teachers, they don't really understand a ga or much about gaming, how people take it. So when people are gaming, probably in school, they often get in trouble, and um, if someone's gaming too hard and their uh, grades start to drop and teachers don't understand that, that's something that's really big. And um, I feel like my teachers in general, when someone's playing games in my class, they don't understand why, and they want them to focus on school mainly, but that's just something that they don't understand. It's more of our generation that understands games better than teachers. Okay, thank you. So there is potential in uh, games for education, but it's not yet uh, harnessed for educational purposes. Okay, thank you. So now we have uh, left 40 minutes uh, and we would like to open up the floor. I hope you have brought your questions with you. You, you see a lot of experience here on the panelists and please we have microphones. You can stand up. Just give us your questions, please. Yes, please, uh, Anjan. Just take the microphone. Just one more. Oh, okay. Is that what? Is there someone else? Okay. Um, I just have a quick question about Thorn um, and one could, of its Could programs. you introduce yourself, oh, please, <laughs> just so that we know who you are? Um, I'm Lola, and I work for a company called Assembly4. Um, I just have a quick question about Thorn. I really admire what you guys are doing and your intentions behind it, but I have a quick question about one of the programs, Spotlight. Um, to my understanding, Spotlight is a tool which is used to help fight, uh, fight sex trafficking online by non-consensually scraping adult directories and handing this data over to platforms such as Amazon, Facebook, and much more. Um, as a consensual sex worker myself, who has been directly affected by the online sex trafficking and erasing of women, queer people, and marginalised communities online, um, I'd like to understand how Spotlight is handing, handling my data and where I can find information about it, um, as well as whether this data as rumours have it, have been handed over to authorities such as ICE and Border Control. Um, I understand that this is a hard problem to solve as we all need a place online, but considering there are over 40 million consensual sex workers right now, how are you ensuring that the data isn't being misused? Thanks so much for your question. Um, so to be very clear, um, you know, we are a mission-based nonprofit, um, and we are building technology to defend children from sexual abuse and exploitation. When it comes to Spotlight, um, you know, we're on, um, a, like you said, publicly available sites, um, and they are uh, sites that are um, confirmed to have child victims on them. I think what we're doing um, is ensuring that we are 100% deploying the most cutting-edge technology to be put to bear for children who are in um, these scenarios. And I think when it comes to gaming, to bring it back to what we're talking about today, I think what, um, you know, just to give a sense of what this looks like, right? So we are talking about children who, um, you know, I'll go back to a case that was in New York where a child was on a gaming platform. They are um, just 
talking as you were at the, with the chat functions. And um, they, a nine-year-old boy was approached by a 16-year-old boy on this gaming platform. He said, you know, I am, you know, I see that you're struggling a little bit. I'd like to help you. How can we, you know, work together? Can I give you some tips? And they started chatting on these platforms. Um, and uh, a couple weeks later, what happened was the child, um, the 16-year-old said, listen, I'm in a lot of trouble. Um, can I, um, in, you know, someone's going to kill me. And the nine-year-old said, what are you talking about? That's, that's awful. How can I help? And the 16-year-old said, well, you know, it would be really helpful is if you could send me a photo of yourself with your, with your shirt off. That would really help me. And so the boy did it, um, the nine-year-old. Um, and then the 16-year-old stopped talking to him. Um, he went um, offline, came back on a couple weeks later, and the nine-year-old said, oh my gosh, where have you been? Um, you know, are you okay? What's happened? He's like, yeah, that was so helpful. Thank you so much. Continued. That was part of the grooming process we're talking about. Um, when a couple weeks later, the boy said, um, you know, again, I'm in this, I'm in trouble. Um, can you help me? And 16-year-old and the nine-year-old said, of course. And the 16-year-old said, well, this time I need a nude photo of you. And so the boy took it with his iPad, the nine-year-old. Um, and luckily, what happened was the um, father of the nine-year-old had seen these photos. He had you know, an Apple TV. He was able to see when he had logged on the most recent photos that were taken with his iPad. And he was able to then go to the authorities, report this, and found out that this child, the 16-year-old, was actually a 30-year-old man um, in another state. So the importance of building in protections for children on these platforms is um, immense. And um, that's what our mission is as an organization, is to be building in the protections so that those you know, minority cases are able to be addressed. Okay, thank you for this uh, uh, for this example. Although, from a child's rights perspective, I would say, luckily, the the nine-year-old was saved, but it was uh, uh, also an infringement of his privacy if his parents could monitor everything he was doing. So, we how do we balance that approach between the children's rights perspective and, of course, their right to be protected. Mm -hmm. I think it's very difficult. Uh, we do have more questions from the floor. Can I go again? Is that I, okay? I don't want to have you two only a dialogue, So, but if you want to respond to what Emily has said, you're welcome. Sure. Um, I just wanted to, I guess you didn't really answer the question that I was putting forward in how my data is being used and where it's going and how I can access that because we don't have control over that and it seems a little bit like mass surveillance. No, appreciate the question. I think um, since we're talking about gaming today, maybe we could have an offline conversation. Sure. Okay, next question, please. Hi, um, this is Edmund Chung from Dot Asia. Uh, but Asking a question as a, a, a father of a seven-year-old and five-year-old, of the last year or so, I've been um, kind of obviously testing when they can have their own device or when they can have you know, their own time with their own device and often use the addiction kind of rule. If I can't get it back from them within a short period of time, then they don't get you know, their own time. The older one now has, has her own device. Um, and one of the things that is very interesting to me that was touched on, but I wonder if there are further research, and if not, um, I, I, I think we need that kind of research. I think uh, Stinky mentioned it, and, and, and Daniel also mentioned it. There's, there, there are games that, um, or there are situations where it's beneficial or it actually helps uh, kids grow up through, through games, through esports, and through, through the, through the um, uh, th through the environment, but then there are also situations where it switches over to, to become addiction, to become problematic. Where is that line? How do we detect that line, especially for parents, I guess, where, you know, uh, without, without necessarily uh, invading, invade, uh, invading into, into their privacy, how do we get a sense of when that, you know, that switch might be happening, and how do we encourage the, the more positive direction. Are there research on that? Can you point me to that? If not, you know, I, I guess we need 
more of that, uh, uh, finding that line and also, you know, publicizing how, how that line could be found. I, I'm sure it's a fuzzy line. It's definitely not, not a very, you know, clear cut, this is a yellow line and you can't go across it. But, you know, I guess that's, that's the main question. Of course, since all children are individual, you could not answer that with a strict line, but Danielle has volunteered to give you an answer. You laugh, but... Um, so I think there are a couple of things to say. I mean, first, first, I do think the use of the term addiction is unfortunate. Um, I think overuse is, is probably more accurate because addiction draws so many parallels to substance use behaviors that aren't really supported. Going into the research on, um, on overuse or excessive use of technology, which is something I've engaged in in the past 10 years or so, um, we're in a bit of a tricky situation because most of that research is really not well done at all. Um, in fact, I would say when you look at research on children's use of digital technology broadly, uh, the field that they call addiction research is probably the worst in terms of methodological quality. Now, you ask an important question, which is when can parents know if something is turning from healthy use to harmful use? Um, and I would say that the best way to do that is to just observe your child and look at their behaviors, not necessarily only within the gaming platform, but actually outside of it. So do they stop going to school? Do they stop seeing their friends? Do they become more and more isolated? Do they seem depressed? And I think Stinky actually put it really well. Um, Overuse of technology in general, if you look at the, although it's poor, if you look at the body of research that we have, it suggests that it's a coping mechanism to deal with um, general life problems, right? Um, and so, yeah, if you, if you see your child just becoming um, less social, more inwards, um, signs that something isn't really right, that's what you should pay attention to. And I'm not saying that this is the only reason why children play a lot of games. Most children who play a lot of games, they don't have these problems, which I think is really important to, to keep in mind. Um, but I would really um, suggest that you focus less on, on the connection with the device or the overuse of the device than to how your child is actually behaving and feeling in, in life in general. Thank you, Daniel. Anyone else from the panel who want to respond to that question? Vicky or John? There was a study done, it's a long, long time ago, I mean, like more than 10 years ago, which is, you know, like three generations in, uh, in, in the internet space. And these were about some guys who'd been caught and convicted of collecting child sex abuse material. And for some of them, there's absolutely no question that part of the attraction was not the content of the images, but the mere fact of collecting them and ordering them and getting complete series of them and things of that kind. So in, in other words, I mean, obviously there must have been an underlying sexual interest in children, but it was quite clear from the psychological profiles and the analysis that was done of some of these guys that what it, it wasn't so much the, it, it was the notion of having a complete set and a complete collection on all of these things was part of the attraction. And that goes to Stinky's point in a way that sometimes if you do find people who are excessively engaged in something, it's, there's something else going on. It's not the device, it's not the game, it's something about that person that means it's a kind of displacement activity or a focus for an underlying psychological state, an unhappiness. You know, if your girlfriend's just kicked you or whatever, uh, you go and find something else to do to take the pain away. Uh, Anjan Bose from UNICEF. Uh, thanks to all the panelists for a very stimulating conversation. Uh, the point that I would like to raise is uh, following on Juta's initial comment on research, uh, sorry, product development by design. Um, and I think uh, this is an area where the industry, uh, particularly, um, I know it's a competing space, it's a revenue generation model they have, but what is the current thinking in terms of sharing good practices? Uh, between cross-sector uh, and uh, enhancing maybe the reporting mechanism. 
uh, when, uh, how well established is it right now in terms of the gaming industry? Um, because, you know, from child online protection point of view, uh, my colleague Daniel had alluded to the balanced approach that we have at UNICEF in terms of ensuring all kind of rights uh, that children are entitled to are upheld. Uh, but particularly from a protection point of view, I would say that um, uh, this is something that we need to urge uh, the industry to, to take forward. And uh, following on John's point, he mentioned some grave cases uh, related to the online world. And um, as Stinky mentioned, there has been an evaluation, uh, uh, evolution of, of the technologies. And soon we will be going into a uh, virtual reality space. It's not too far in the future. And what that means uh, for offenders who have vested interest in children and how do they see this platform. So that research and product development design, you know, uh, is very critical and we need to think crucially. Uh, and finally, I just wanted to say that, uh, you know, when children uh, collect assets in the game, gaming platform, it's very close to them. And um, when they lose those assets, can be quite detrimental and that can lead to very dire consequences for them. And how do we build, uh, as we go online, how do we create a you know, culture of trust um, so that, and education so that children understand um, the, you know, that online world obviously has its own realm, but in terms of the offline world, uh, how do we build those ethos into the online world? Thank you. Thank you, and John, for that question. Before we turn to the issue of education, I, I would like to ask Lise, because I know you have had interviews with game industry, and I know that child protection is not in the main focus, but have you found anything out about how, how ready they are to cooperate, to exchange experiences, the, the gaming industry, the developers, and, and the companies? Um. I think it was really different. Uh, yeah, there were various approaches. You mean cooperate, cooperation between the gaming industry and like um, child rights activists or like um, representatives. Um, well, I, I remember in one interview where I asked about um, how this uh, particular developer felt about maybe building in monetization strategies that were a bit too exploitative. And he would say, yeah, but we have this new regulation now where you cannot call the app free anymore and you could just say it has in-app purchases. And it seemed he was kind of pushing away the responsibility. Uh, others were more like reflected about it. Like, yeah, I know it's a gray area and we try not. Of course, a lot of them said our games do not, are not made for kids in the first place, but then you can argue the graphical style does appeal to children very much, so it's maybe too easy to say that. But generally, I think um, awareness can be raised there about the implications. So they were not, I think, maybe that's also a finding of the report, but it, yeah, it sh I think it should grow amongst game developers to, to make sure they know they have this awareness. Of course, also with the sheer numbers of players they have, um, it grows, yeah. Yeah, I just want to echo this, uh, this experience. I mean, when we spoke to companies before, during, and after developing this report, I, our sense was that there is a general awareness that they need to do something. Many of them don't know what to do, um, and they are very open to suggestions. But then, of course, there's a question of whether the suggestions get implemented, which is when the whole kind of profit argument comes in. Uh, and I think one of our conclusions is that this is still a fairly new industry, um, and I think they have quite a bit of work left to do in the protection space, but I don't sense unwillingness, but I think they need to be pushed a little bit to realize that if they don't do this, if they don't take it upon themselves to do this, um, regulation is going to follow, and I think that's going to be worse for their profits overall. So that's kind of an argument that we've been trying to advance. So I, I, I take that for, for something we can take out of the room as a task for the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. We, are, we have already members that come from industry, but I don't think it's the gaming industry yet, so and we will take that forward and, and try what we can do. 
from that. I see two hands in the back of the room. Please just go to the microphone and bring in your question. Hello, um, Sonia Livingstone, uh, Global Kids Online and London School of Economics. So I'm listening to this discussion about gaming, which I'm finding really fascinating and helpful and balanced. But in terms of what should be done next, I'm thinking of all the parallels with social media. And in this room also, in this same dynamic coalition over the last few years, we've been discussing social media. And there, I think the consensus is that we have, as a child rights community, spent really a lot of effort and time identifying that industry, um, working on collaborative approaches to self-regulation, hoping that self-regulation would work, and finding that it has failed. And I think people would really say it has failed in relation to social media. So I'm kind of distressed that the gaming discussion, which is maturing but seems a bit behind, is now saying, if I can pick up on what you just said, Daniel, that we shouldn't, we're now getting to the point where we know how to ask for self-regulation. And can we not just cut past the whole of that and say, we already know that won't work, we've tried it, it's failed. Can we now say what regulation is needed and who is to regulate? Will you? You? Okay. I couldn't agree more. I mean, I've absolutely zero faith in self-regulation in any area in the online space because it has repeatedly been shown to fail. Uh, I was at a, an event um, in New York last week uh, and met some couple of guys, journalists who've been working in this area. Things that we had all believed to be true turned out not to be true. And they were able to document it. Why were they able to document it? Because they had a very, very generous employer, the New York Times newspaper, who allowed these guys six months and provided them with a substantial budget to fly around the world and with legal advice every step of the way to document and research how the promises that have been made and the statements that are being made in public in the name of self-regulation were not actually working at all. And I don't believe that the games industry will be any different. So I'm afraid my confidence and faith in self-regulation is zero. So I agree very much with what uh, the implication of what you've just said, Sonia. You may as well just get right to it and start saying it needs to be regulated. And I think privacy regulators or something like that, privacy commissioners would be a good way in. And I think the approach of the Five, five, five Rights Foundation and that kind of thing, that's, that's a, a potential avenue. And I'll just mention one thing or emphasize one other thing. So in the UK and most countries, it is illegal for children under the age of 18 to gamble, okay? And certainly in the UK, and again in many other countries, if you want to go to a traditional gambling website, you have to go through an age verification process before you can place a bet. Loot boxes break, bust that open in the gaming environment. They are going to be regulated in the United Kingdom by the, we have a, a regulator in the, in the gambling space. But I think it should be made clear to, to games companies that if you socialize gambling, if your games, if the games that you produce look very much like gambling and encourage gambling type behavior, even if there's no microtransaction involved, in other words, even if there's no money changing hands, it should still not be allowed in the game unless you've taken steps to ensure that the people playing the game are over 18. We, there was a game called Texas Hold'em Up Poker. I don't know if you remember that. It was a free game, so-called free game, that was available on many, it was available on Facebook, it was available on mobile phone applications. I lodged a complaint, I'm, believe it or not, I'm not normally the kind of person who complains, at least not through official channels, uh, but I did on this occasion, and I made a complaint about that game, and my complaint was upheld. It was a free game, any child could access it, and it was, it was essentially a card game. So this was a way of socializing children into the idea of playing cards to win things shouldn't be happening. So that's another dimension to that. I know uh, Vicky mentioned that, and Stinky mentioned loot boxes and so on. They're not the only example, but that has to be part of the picture too. Thank you. Daniel, it's your for So many things I want to say now. Um, <laughs> so my understanding was that the gambling regulator said that not all loot boxes will actually qualify as gambling, and that's mm -hmm. where the discussion was. Perhaps I'm wrong on that, though. Yeah, no? 
Okay, we, we can talk about that. Sonia, um, very interesting question. I think I half agree and half disagree. Um, I think my worry is that we don't really know what aspects of it to regulate. I mean, when we did this report, we also noted that actually most of the risks and opportunities for the gaming sector are shared with social media companies. Um, but my concern is that um, we don't really know what aspects of the gaming environment to regulate, and given all of the, I would say, bordering on moral panic discourses that go around, I would be very concerned with overregulation. I think already we heard about some of the challenges that you can, um, that you can see when you start looking at, uh, I mean, it was a question about spotlight, right, and the non-consensual scraping of data. Already there, we're into a really complicated discussion. So I think if we want to move towards regulation, what we need to do is to distinguish somehow how much of the risk of harm to a child is actually due to the gaming environment itself versus the company versus actually what I would call the individual or personal choice. Um, I mean, John, you made examples about um, sexual abuse and how games facilitate that. I think this crime has existed long before games came around, but the game is, gaming environment is now a facilitator, so we need to consider the implications of that. But if we talk about something like overuse or overspending, um, I would say that that perhaps falls more on the individual, and that there are unethical um, practices that might push uh, young people into spending, which perhaps we should look at. Um, but I, I do think we need to consider a bit more carefully what kind of risks that are actually due to the gaming environment or the company. Um, and you know, even free-to-play business models, uh, I don't think they are necessarily problematic. In fact, you might say that free-to-play games promote inclusivity, because free games can be accessible by anyone irrespective of their socioeconomic status, which is a good thing. But the microtransaction element can actually be designed into a game in a way that is either positive or negative. So I wouldn't say we're quite there yet, but perhaps you know, a bit more work to be done figuring out which risks to address. I'm, I'm very grateful, uh, Daniel, for bringing us back to what we started with, that is the children's right to leisure, play, and culture. And of course, games are now part of a digital culture of children growing up today. I know that John wants to chime in, and I see another hand in the back, so please stand up, go to the microphone while John is shortly answering yeah, that just, question. Just, uh, my heart bleeds. I mean, really, I'm very, very anxious about the prospect of over-regulating the industry. Not. If they want to avoid being over-regulated, the answer is very simple. Open the books. Let's see what's actually happening. Give the data to the academics. Give the data to... To, to parents, be open about it. That's the only, way. and if they won't do it, and by the way, I don't think they will, then of course politicians are gonna step in. That's what politicians are there for in democracies, to respond to anxieties that are expressed. And if they want to avoid over-regulation, open the books. Thank you. Hi, uh, I'm really great that that's where we're at. Thanks, John. Uh, I'm Bhavna from IT for Change. Uh, this is a great, very balanced conversation uh, and uh, about the promises and the perils of the gaming industry. And uh, I'm going to follow up from the last couple of threads in this conversation today uh, about regulation and uh, the importance of trying to um, bring in regulation within these spaces. Um, and uh, if you're interested in having or being a part of a, another conversation on this, uh, we'll be uh, doing a panel on the 20, 29th uh, um, on Internet Detox, which will focus on uh, governance frameworks for online content regulation generally. Um, and uh, uh, I kind of wanted to highlight the fact that there is undoubtedly an under-addressed and distressing problem of uh, harassment and abuse within the game verse. And uh, it's uh, acknowledged to be a somewhat misogynistic and abusive um, space. And uh, as Sean mentioned, it creates high burdens on children to be careful about what they say and how they present themselves online. And this is the space where children are uh, essentially learning to socialize. Um, these are the spaces where um, I think we definitely need some important interventions and regulations to be framed um, with grave seriousness and, uh, um, let's say, with, with a lot of uh, fire behind our heels, because uh, we are waiting on an entire generation to grow up in uh, 
you know, social media interfaced gaming spaces which are going to have a massive effect on the culture of the next generation. Um, so uh, I invite your comments on this. Uh, um, on that note, incidentally, I think uh, there's some applications of AI that are being um, looked into. I think Microsoft is looking, looking into getting, uh, using AI to filter conversations within Xbox games and uh, create some sort of sliding scale to make uh, different levels of visibility of vulgar or whatever, of uh, uh, you know, a content that shouldn't be um, visible to children by default. And perhaps there are mechanisms that we can explore along the lines of uh, privacy, you know, safety by design, not just privacy by design. Thank you. I do think this was not a question to any of the panelists. It was more like a statement. Thank you for that. Um, I, I would like to come to, to closing the session, uh, but first I would go back to the, that question that was mentioned at some points. Uh, so what can we achieve with education of children? We, we've heard a lot now that we would need regulation. We also, maybe we don't trust in self-regulation, but still I would not uh, abandon the concept completely, trying to figure out what self-regulation uh, could be do. But, but of course we, we have been talking about children communicating with their parents, with their peers about what they are doing there. But still, uh, when gaming and Sean and I had a talk yesterday already, uh, I do think at some, you come to some point where you just are so emotionally attracted to the game that you might just forget what you've learned about how to behave. Uh, I do think children, most children have learned now the lesson not to give away their real name, not to give away their address or the school they uh, attend. But still, when, when playing games, you're emotionally in, involved in, in the game. And could you say where you, where you can draw the line? Or have you experienced a situation where you would say, OK, it's just I'm into the game, and I, I want to be protected, but it's not only my own responsibility? Um, I think that there should definitely be a line. I just, having me being 14, I don't know where to draw the line, so I can't really give a um, thoughtful answer on that. Um, but um, uh, yeah, I just, I have no clue. But um, other, I feel like you should like not give away what you do for a living or like what your age is, um, as you said. Um, but I do have friends that unfortunately do do that. And um, I feel like to them, it's a second world. Video gaming is um, a second world. And they uh, do believe that they should give personal information because it's what they love to do. And um, unfortunately, that's where it's at right now. OK. Yeah, so just to chip in uh, as to sort of what the next steps could look like, I think it's important to, to recognize that there's a whole host of issues within gaming. It's not a single, it's not a single threat. You know, as you're talk, uh, talking earlier, there's issues with the monetization. There's issues with the graphic, uh, you know, violence or whatever. I think for graphical stuff, we actually have a pretty good system that borrows from, you know, the, the, the feature film ratings, for example. But I think it's important to recognize that there's a lot of aspects of gaming that need to be, I, I guess, sorted out in a framework before you can start addressing these issues individually. And I think a large part, for example, would be for research to focus specifically on one aspect, be it the monetization, be it the addiction. And I believe personally that there's a lot of potential for qualitative research rather than just quantitative to actually build you know, best practice guidelines like we have on a lot of other things. I think that just doesn't exist for gaming at the moment. Thank you so much. So as I don't see any more raised hands, I would like to have a very quick last round of all the panelists. And I would like to ask you, what is your takeaway from this session in regard of children having the right to leisure, play, and culture, but at the same time having the right to be protected in the digital world. And we start with John because I know you are quick in thinking and you have your answer already. No question children should be able to benefit from all of the great stuff that games can do. 
no issue there at all, but we do need the, the games industry to step up and appreciate that they need to do a lot more to keep it safe and healthy. Uh, I guess my one biggest takeaway is that we're, we're kind of behind as far as a lot of aspects go as opposed to the adoption of games, which has just exploded in recent years. So there's a lot of work which needs to be done and ideally fast. I think, am I allowed to? The first is that we can't leave it to parents. The second is that we need to be really careful when we talk about the games industry. It's not just one industry and it's not like the social media industry. There's a difference between publishers and developers and we get, need to be much more sophisticated if we are gonna think about legislation that we understand what we're legislating about. Um, I feel like all of us should probably talk with people more like my age because it's easier to talk with people that have been spending time playing these games and get a better understanding for um, people that actually have played games. Thank you. I'd agree with um, what some of my colleagues on the panel have said that there has to be this balance between making sure that children have the safeguards necessary to be able to play in these spaces and understand, um, you know, with, kids are already developing these and, and knowing how to do that. What more can we give them? What kind of tools can we give them to be able to play in this space safely? And then on the other side, not putting the burden only on the children, but also what can the platforms be doing to um, better safeguard kids as we've talked about in a safety by design fashion. And I'll, I'll build on that a little bit and say that I, I was, I'm, I'm pleased that there is a good mix of um, it's a good mix of the representation, people in the room, people on the panel, people have different views. And I think that's very promising because, because it's gonna help us achieve balance in whatever solutions we, we arrive at. And I also wanna second what Sean said, we need to involve people who actually play games in these discussions. Yeah, I would like to pick up on what John said earlier about the games industry needs to open up uh, to provide access to academia, to regulators, that we know what is going on there and only then we can begin to regulate. And I also think, I agree that games industry is in many ways also behind in terms of, yeah, diversity and um, there's a, yeah, quite a long way to go there, I think. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much uh, to all of you in the room for attending this session. I hope you have your own takeaways. Again, I would like to repeat the invitation to join the Dynamic Coalition on Child Online Safety. We will be here in the room. You can approach us. Uh, and those who are already members of the Dynamic Coalition, please stay a few more minutes in the room so that we can see who would be interested to join us and agree on, on a meeting uh, time and date uh, during these days to come. Uh, at, uh, as the last comment, I would like to mention that all dynamic coalitions, which are 17 now in the IGF ecosystem, will have their uh, common main session on Thursday afternoon, 4.30 in the convention main hall number two. And there we will relate the work of the dynamic coalitions to the sustainable development goals. Um, of course, we have some takeaways from the session that will also go into that main session. So you are uh, very warm, warmly welcome to come to that main session on Thursday afternoon as well. Thanks to all my really, really brilliant panelists. I'm glad you have been here and I do think we had a very good debate and a special thanks to Sean. Thank you. Yes.